Hello, everyone. Um, hi from LCC from Klaipeda, Lithuania. I would like to know where you are from. Type in the chat where you are watching this from. I'd like to know which countries you're joining us from. Okay. I can see some people from Lithuania. From Ukraine. Czech Republic, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, okay, Czech, welcome. Okay, we're going to wait a few more minutes. Okay, I see people from Moldova. Nice, welcome. Okay, so we see Lithuania Konas, Kazakhstan, Latvia, welcome, Armenia, nice, Ukraine, really diverse audience. Welcome from Lithuania as well to you too. We're so happy that you've decided to join us today. All right, I guess we can start and um, welcome everyone. We're so happy that uh, you're here together with us learning and it's a pleasure um, to be able to share our expertise with our colleagues across the world. And um, let me quickly um, introduce who we are. Uh, we are LCC International University. And uh, this is the first webinar from our mini professional development series for English language teachers. And once you have joined us, feel free to comment in the chat section where you're joining us from, and uh, we're very happy to have you here with us. So LCC is the only uh, North American um, style university in the heart of Europe. We are located in Lithuania, in the beautiful city of Klaipeda, right by the Baltic Sea. Um, so if you look, we're here at the top. We're very lucky to be here and enjoy the beautiful coast. LCC is a truly unique university. Uh, we teach only in English and we use the educational model called liberal arts. And um, LCC is an international community. Um, 
And we have students from over 50 countries uh, studying at LCC. And um, our faculty come from different countries such as the United States, Canada, and as well as Europe and other parts of the world. Um, what makes us unique in this um, region is that we are a Christian values university and we follow uh, the Christian worldview. We're also fully accredited and our diplomas are fully accepted worldwide. And we are a relational university. We do care about our students, our community and colleagues, which is why we're doing this seminar because we want to um, share the knowledge that we have to help you in your teaching journey. We have um, six BA programs and two master's programs. And one that might be of particular interest to you is the MA TESOL uh, program. And in this program, um, we offer a number of benefits. The, one of them being that um, the courses are taught by experts in the field who um, engage with the students and care about their progress. Um, another cool perk is that um, MA TESOL students can do their practicum in Lithuania um, during our Summer Language Institute. And the course uh, is a blended type of course and you can complete it in two years. And what's unique about MA TESOL is that not only you will be able to gain new knowledge and develop your teaching skills even further, but it also gives you an opportunity to um, look at other ethical aspects of teaching and learning. If you're not sure if online learning is for you, why don't you give a try? So we do have um, seven week um, courses that you could join from the MAT SOL program. They are all online. And one great aspect is that if you do complete the course successfully, you will get six ECT credits that you can later on add to your um, formal education. So this seminar webinar is um, hosted by the English Language Center. And I am the English Language Center Director, Martina, and I'm so glad that we have you here today with us. And I hope this webinar is going to be useful to you. I would like to tell you a bit about what the English Language Center does. We call it the Global Hub for English Language Instruction and Teacher Professional Development because we aim to give our students such language instruction that would help them to become effective communicators in the modern world. We also base our methodology on the most current philosophies and um, we encourage our students as well as teaching professionals to develop their long life learning and engage in personal and professional growth. At the ELC, we offer different types of programs. So we cater to adults, children, and adolescents. And we also offer professional development opportunities for English teachers like you. This is the first seminar and uh, the next uh, uh, webinar will take place um, next week, same time, same place. And um, this webinar will be on differentiation. So if you register for this one, you should also get a link um, to um, this webinar as well next week. The webinar will be presented by our English department chair, uh, Robin Gingrich. And um, we're really, really excited about this one as well. Today's seminar is called It's All Fun and Games and Learning, um, Games in the English Language Classroom. And um, I'm very happy to present to you my uh, colleague, Gretchen Kettner. She is the director of our intensive English programs, um, Prime in the Summer 
uh, Language Institute, and she, I'm sure she will be able to share some valuable insight and practical tips with you. So I'm handing over the floor to Gretchen. Hey. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's really good to see all of these names and locations in the chat. I just love that we're coming together from so many different places in the world uh, just to share ideas and to get some new, new insights and new ideas that we can apply in our own classrooms, maybe even tomorrow. So let me share my screen. As Martina said, this, uh, this webinar is focusing on games in the language classroom. Uh, and as she said, I work with our intensive English programs here at LCC, um, and I've been teaching English for academic purposes for a number of years now. And even in this more academic setting, I have found that it's really helpful on many levels to have some games, some good language learning games in my teaching toolbox um, to pull out and bring to my students for their learning and engagement and hopefully fun. So speaking of fun, just starting out with a quote that I, I really like that says, learning can and should be hard fun. And I appreciate the, the joining here of the idea of fun and engaging and having a good time in the classroom with the idea of challenge and something something that pushes us to be better or to learn more to do more and i think that's that's something that games can provide for us in the classroom they can make learning hard fun so first we should really think about what is a game what do we mean when we talk about a, a language learning game and so first we have a, a little bit of a complex definition so a game is a competitive activity played according to rules within a given context where you need to meet a challenge to achieve an objective and win it often involves scoring and points a maybe slightly simpler definition could be that a game is an activity with rules, a goal, and an element of fun. And so this simpler definition also allows us to think about what uh, we might call game-like activities. So sometimes we have activities in our classrooms that aren't truly games. Maybe we've taken out the competitive element, but they still meet a lot of the definition of games and provide this kind of hard fun for our students. I would imagine that many of you also use games in your classrooms or at least have thought about it or seen it done. And so I'm curious to hear from you, what do you think are some of the benefits of using games in the English language classroom? So if you could take a moment, if you have an idea, just to type your idea in the chat and we'll see what comes up and then we can talk about them from there. Motivating students. Yes, relaxing way of learning, absolutely. You get to know your students, that is a really good benefit. It's more interactive. Yes, it really can help to create a fun atmosphere and engagement for the students. Helps them to love language. Definitely good for practicing grammar, um, for having some competition, for decreasing inhibition, that's a good one. Yes, getting them to laugh and enjoy. Um, being able to relax, I think, is really good in a stressful situation. Learning vocabulary, allow people to feel more comfortable, more engaged. Yes, to reduce their fear of learning, to change the pace. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, activate shy students, those who might not participate in more traditional activities, more speaking opportunities, 
yes, there are, there are so many benefits. Um, and you have touched on many of them, I think in your, in your responses. Yeah. Participation from all learners, um, those who might not jump in, in other activities, enjoyable at any age. Yeah. Yeah. Fun and active. Yeah. Everyone gets involved in the learning process. Definitely. Improving speaking skills. These are great responses. I think that um, you have you have hit on a lot of them. As I thought about this and looked into this, I found so many benefits that are possible when it comes to using games in the classroom. In many different areas, as we see. So there are cognitive benefits. The, the use of games can help to review and to reinforce what we've been learning in the classroom and to extend beyond maybe the basics that we've been learning. Um, using games, it, the games are a situation where students have opportunities to communicate, to use the language in meaningful ways, um, to practice realistic use, to negotiate meaning with their classmates or their teammates in the game. So just in terms of cognitive processes and learning, there are benefits. Affective benefits, some of you mentioned these right away when you talked about that it takes away fear. Another way to put it is it lowers the affective filter. And we find that students are maybe more open to trying and to learning. Um, many people mentioned motivation as a benefit. Um, and maybe especially for younger learners, uh, I work with young adults, we could say. They are usually around 18 and above. Um, and so they, I think they still fall in the category of being very motivated by games and competition. Um, sometimes I think those who work with adult learners might find that you occasionally have an adult learner who says, oh, why are we doing this? I'm not motivated to do this because it doesn't seem like real study to me. Um, but hopefully if they are willing to give it a try, they can find out that there are learning benefits to the game. Um, just allowing students to be more creative with the language that they are learning. And as a few people mentioned, fostering a positive attitude toward classroom and toward the learning experience is a really great benefit. Related to that, I have definitely seen class dynamic benefits uh, to the use of games as well. Games are a great way to make our classrooms more student-centered. So as the teacher, if I introduce the game and show how to play the game, I often get to step aside. And now I've become a facilitator or a coach or even a cheerleader rather than being the person up front who's dispensing the knowledge all of the time. I think games can help to build class cohesion and community. Students can feel more connected to each other. As several of you mentioned, encouraging full class participation. So the dominant students aren't the only ones who are getting involved here. Hopefully everyone has a chance. I think games can encourage healthy competition. That's the kind of competition we'd like to see. Um, and that is motivating as we know. And playing games can help to develop interpersonal skills as students learn how to, how to respond appropriately in different situations and how to interact with their teammates and, and their classmates. I would add a few other benefits of games. Um, there are a lot of games that are very flexible. They can be adapted to different ages or different language levels, depending on what you have to work with in your classroom. Uh, many games can also be adapted depending on if you want to emphasize more fluency or more accuracy in the lessons that you're teaching. Often games can incorporate most or all of the language skills. So even if you're teaching grammar classes, if you have some games going on, you can get students listening and speaking and possibly even reading and writing. Once they're developed, another benefit of games is that they can be very time efficient. I think to, if you're developing a new game, it can take time to make the materials or to think about all the rules and processes. 
um, and to explain those to the students. But once you have that in place and once the students know what to do, then it's easy to pull out the game and say, we're going to play bingo or we're going to play a Kahoot or whatever. Um, everyone knows what to do and it doesn't take you very much time to plan either. And of course, uh, I believe someone mentioned this as well. It can be a break from the regular class, classroom routine, just changing the pace, changing um, the focus of what's going on in the classroom to give everyone something like a break just to do something different. So there are so many benefits that we can list that I think it makes it really worthwhile to think about how can I make use of this in my classroom in some way. Before we get into thinking about what are good games though, we do need to think about what makes a language learning game effective? What are the elements that we need um, to make this a truly good and effective activity for our students? So uh, an effective game is going to need clear and explicit instructions. Um, and as I think we all know, giving instructions can be a big challenge. I find it very helpful to, um, not only to think out, but even to write out step by step what the directions of the game are. And I've also found it helpful to even just put those step by step instructions on a slide for the students so that we can all see them and know exactly what we're supposed to do and what the rules are. An effective game has a clear goal or outcome. So all the players know what the aim is and what they're shooting for, what they're trying to do. Of course, an effective language learning game requires at least one language skill to be effective. And you have to, in order to be successful at the game, you're going to need to use the language skills that you're learning. An effective game is going to include a task or tasks that are appropriate to the learners and appropriate cognitively. So that based on their age, based on their developmental level, and then of course, in terms of their language level as well. So we don't wanna ask beginner learners to tell a long, long story, for example, as part of a game. Um, they, they don't have the language yet to do that, but we can find games that are appropriate to their level. A, a, a really effective game, if we're going to think about how it, how it connects with our larger purpose as teachers is going to be contextualized in some way. It's part of the bigger picture of what we're doing in the class or what our curriculum is focusing on. I think once in a while, there's probably nothing wrong with just pulling out a sort of a random game to play for fun, but it's also really valuable to think about what am I doing in the class? What am I wanting the students to learn this week or this month? And how can my game connect with that in order to reinforce that, in order to help the students take steps in that direction? An effective game is going to involve all group members, as some people said in their comments. Um, we don't want to have games where only, only the people who feel strong in the language or who like competition are participating, but that everybody is going to get involved. And it will allow enough time for participants to complete the tasks. We need to make sure that we, that we leave enough time so that people can do what they need to do and not become frustrated with it. Okay, so now that we've talked about kind of what a game is and all the many benefits and what can make a game truly effective, I'm curious to know about some of the games that you like to use in your classes. So if you have a game that you like and you wanna mention it, please type it in the chat. If you don't have a name for the game, just try typing a brief description. Maybe that can give us an idea of what it is. Okay, this is so fun to see what people do. Simon says, Kahoot, oh, they're going fast. Apples to apples, bingo, around the world, hangman, who am I? Bamboozle, fun. Um, oh, never have I ever for present perfect. That's great. Um, yes, there's so many ways you can use bingo. It's so, it's so useful. Circle activities for vocabulary. John says, is that like Simon says? Um, charades with drawing on the board, taboo board games. Okay, learning apps, is that, is that a platform? 
to make exercises in games. That's good to know. I spy. Yeah, these are great. They're, and many of them, yeah, taboo is so fun. Oh, truth and a lie, like one truth and a lie. Bomb game. Oh, I'm curious about that. Um, yeah, describing the words so others can guess the words. I think there's a lot of variations on that that are good. Mafia. <laughs> Our students love mafia. Um, Quizlet. We'll talk about Quizlet a little bit. Board games. Word wall. Odd man out. Asking yes or no questions to guess the word. So a kind of 20 questions game. Yeah. Quizzes. Very good. I'm making a, a quizzes. Um, quiz for my students to play tomorrow. Um, hangman, bingo, chain game. So many good ones. Scriblio, that's a new one to me. I, I'm not familiar with that. I'm going to have to find out more about that. Okay, good. Yeah. Ooh, word snake. That sounds like fun. <laughs> Thank you so much. These are really, really good, um, good suggestions. And I see that, you know, so many of us have lots of uh, lots of good things already going on. One of the things that I really enjoy about being part of a webinar or some kind of teacher professional development seminar is that we all get to share ideas and I get ideas that I might be able to apply in my classroom as well. Okay, so we all have possible games. We all have some ideas already of, of games that we like to use. I want to talk a little bit about uh, just the types of games and types in terms of the level or type of language that they focus on and that they sort of force students to pay attention to. And we can, we can break these down by, uh, by, level of language in terms of what you see here. There can be games that focus on phonetics, phonology, and pronunciation. We can have games that kind of work at the level of morphology or vocabulary, so kind of word level games. Games that focus on syntax and grammar, so we might think about these as sentence level work or sentence level activities. Um, some games require understanding and be, being able to express things about semantics or idiomatic usage. So they're focusing on the shades of meaning of a word or maybe a range of meanings that words can have. And then going to the broadest level, we can have games that require sk skills at the discourse or pragmatics level. So um, beyond the sentence level, where students are maybe having less structured or less rehearsed utterances that they're producing that they have to be able to do, um, you know, beyond just the sentence level. So I want to look at the, each of these types and share a few examples of what that might look like with each, um, within each type of game. So if we we're talking about games that, games that work with the phonology level, let's say the phonetics level. Um, there are things like phoneme bingo that you can play. And that can take a, that can take different forms. You know, maybe you have the students um, listen to a word and cover on their bingo board, cover a rhyming word compared to what they've heard or listen to a phoneme. So hear one sound and then cover the letter that makes one that makes that sound if they're if they're learning the the English alphabet or the Latin alphabet. Um, there can, you can use minimal pair flashcards. So maybe you have something like, you know, cards with different minimal pairs, um, ship and sheep, for example. Um, the students have them and you can do a word grab with that. So the teacher says the word and the, the students in their group need to grab, try to grab the correct word card first. Can they hear the difference in those minimal pairs? Um, tongue twisters that can have a competitive element or not, um, as they, as they try to say the difficult, tricky things as part of pronouncing and then practicing pronunciation would, could be another fun game. So those are a few examples of phonetics level games. Probably no surprise to any of us that when we talk about 
the morphology level or vocabulary or word level games. There are many, many examples. Um, some of the ones that, that you shared also fall into these categories. So of course we have all kinds of platforms that we can use to make quiz games where we can quiz words and definitions. Um, Kahoot is very popular. I know my students really enjoy it. Uh, Jeopardy is another one. I'll show you later a platform where you can make a Jeopardy game that could be used to quiz words and definitions. Memory games can be useful for the, um, working with vocabulary. It seems really simple, but even in my academic reading and vocabulary classes here at LCC, sometimes we play memory matching with our vocabulary words. So we have a set of cards with the words, we have a set of cards with the definitions, we spread them out face down and we try to find matches. Of course, we have high, higher tech versions of that now too. So you can go online to uh, platforms like Quizlet and make flashcard games that, um, that you can play. Bingo, bingo was mentioned a lot. Bingo is such a wonderful game because it's so flexible. There are just so many things you can do with it. So, um, and, and again, as far as being time efficient, my students know how to play vocabulary bingo. And so if I wanna pull that out, it's not difficult. Um, and I have, I have a blank template. I can just give them the, the blank bingo card, have them fill in the words. I read the definitions and they try to cover up the words if they hear them. Snowballs. I don't know if any of you have ever played snowballs. This is a fun, quick vocabulary activity where you have the students are in pairs. Each pair is given a word and maybe a half sheet of blank paper. So the pair has the first task to get the word on one part of the on one paper and the definition on another. When everyone's done that, we crumple up the paper into balls and stand up and I'll give a time limit, maybe 15 seconds. And I say, okay, for the next 15 seconds, you just throw as many snowballs around the room as you want to. And so the students think this is great because the teacher just told them they could throw paper. And so everyone throws their snowballs until time is called. At that point, whatever you have in your hand or you pick up off the floor, everyone should have one snowball. Uncrumble it. Whatever you see on there, you need to find your match. So if you have a word, you need to find the person who has the matching definition and vice versa. So it's a, it's a very easy game to play. It's kind of a fun time filler or back pocket activity for the end of, for the end of class time. Uh, word grab is another one that is very versatile and fun and definitely has the competitive element. So if you have... Um, so your vocabulary words on cards and the students are working in small groups, two, three, maybe four students to a group. You read a definition, the first student in the group who can grab the correct word, grab the correct card, um, gets the point. And you see which, which student in the group gets the most cards by the end of the game. Other vocabulary games that are really fun and useful that also have you try to guess and express things about the word. Uh, we have words like password, which might also be known as hot seat. Uh, I don't know if this is something that you play with your students. I can quickly describe it. Um, students in small teams are situated so that one member of the team is sitting with their back to the board so they cannot see what's going to be written on there and the other students can see it on the team. Teacher chooses a word from the, probably from the vocabulary list, writes it on the board. It is up to each team to find a way to give, to give clues to their teammate who can't see the word and try to get their teammate to say the focal word. Um, there are different variations of this, but that's another one. It's very easy to set up and it's a lot of fun. Pictionary and charades, these were mentioned in the chat, um, you know, finding some way, even if it's not with words, to express something about the word and then have people guess. And then, of course, taboo, again, describing the word and trying to avoid common keywords that would go with it and get your teammates to guess.
several other several other types of vocabulary games. You have games that emphasize certain categories or relationships. Maybe you're familiar with categories. Uh, another version of this is called Stop the Bus, and we should have time at the end. We'll play a round of Stop the Bus so you can see how it works. And word association, very simple. Um, a few years ago here in Klaipeda, I was a intermediate language student in a class, and our teacher would sometimes play word association with us. He would begin, he would say a word and write it on the board, and the next person just needed to say the first word that came to their mind that had some connection to that word. And then we would go around the circle. And in terms of beginners, some games that we often have on hand that I think can be really useful for beginner practice are Uno, everybody's favorite card game. Um, this is really useful just for practicing the use of colors and numbers. Um, and dice games as well can be really helpful for practicing numbers. As a beginner, beginning learner of Lithuanian, I have used dice games for myself to try to, to get better at my numbers. Moving on, kind of moving up the levels, we can go from word level to more sentence level. Um, so I described memory matching to you. Um, a little later on, I'll, uh, I can say more about memory matching plus. Uh, this is a way to add sentence use to the, the memory matching, just words and definitions card game. Information gap activities are, are really good at the sentence level. Of course, if you have, you know, student A has some of the information and student B has some of the information and they need to ask each other questions. So this is good for uh, question formation, for negotiating meaning between the, the two students and the pair. Um, someone mentioned in the chat a game that um, would involve asking yes, no questions to come to a conclusion and, and guess the word. 20 questions is another version of that or heads up. Um, different versions of heads up. I've seen it done with post-it notes. So we put a word or a famous person's name or something on a sticky note, put it on each student's forehead, they can't see it, and they have to ask questions to find out who or what they are um, from their classmates. Uh, running dictation is another fun and uh, active, actually somewhat active, sentence level, uh, sentence level activity. You have students in teams, you have a short text, maybe it's a poem, maybe it's just a little paragraph uh, that is printed out and posted on the wall at different places around the classroom. And the teams need to take turns sending students to the wall, sending students to the text to read and memorize as much as they can and bring it back and dictate it to their teammate who will write um, and they can they can go back and forth as much as they want, as often as they want. Um, but you can set it up so that there are rewards or points for accuracy and for speed. Um, so I actually just played that with my students a couple of weeks ago, my my intensive English students. When we talk about games that. Um, that requires some knowledge or some, some ability to articulate shades of meaning or ranges of meaning of a word. A really good one is apples to apples. I don't know if uh, folks have access to, to that game, but um, this is the kind of game where you have to uh, choose a word or an idea and justify and explain how it matches closely with another word or idea. So you, you have to be able to explain your choice and justify and explain the relationship between two words. Um, it's also possible to extend a word association game to do a similar thing, and we'll, we'll see that in a minute, um, where not only are we saying a word that we associate with the given word, but now we have to explain the, the relationship between, between the two. We have to explain why I chose this word. And finally, we come to the level of discourse where students are understanding and producing more than just a word or a sentence. Um, so many, so many possibilities for this. There are so many good role-playing 
activities that we can do. Um, as I mentioned, being an intermediate language student a few years ago, um, my teacher played press conference with us and that was a new activity to me. So he had, it was a small class. He had each student in the class choose a famous person. We generated some vocabulary that we would associate with each of those people. And then we took turns being reporters and the famous person in the press conference. And so the reporter students had to ask questions. The famous person student had to answer as if they were that celebrity. Um, so this was, you know, more than just a sentence or two, we were actually having dialogue as the reporters and the famous person. So that's a really good, really good activity. Storytelling, and someone said chain activities in the chat. Um, I think chain stories um, probably falls into that category where someone starts the story and someone else takes it up and gives the next part and we can go all the way around the class and create something maybe really crazy or funny. Different skits can, uh, can encourage this kind of language, language use and to make more of a, maybe not competitive element, but to just to add interest, it's really fun to do something like a paper bag skit where each group is given a bag full of random objects and they have to try to incorporate each object into their skit. Alibi is an excellent game that I learned from Martina during the pandemic. Uh, she found this she found this game to use online with her middle school English students, and um, it's a it's a role playing kind of game that requires many different thinking and language skills. Some students are the alleged criminals, and some students are the detectives. And criminals have to the accused criminals have to um, agree on their story in as much detail as they can. And the detectives have to think of the questions that they want to ask and try to try to catch the criminals in discrepancies or lies in their story. Um, and then of course, there are things that we could do with projects as well and create competitions around projects. Um, one thing that we did recently in the summer at LCC was a Shark Tank project uh, where each group of students had to had to create um, had to create a product that they thought would be interesting and then figure out how to market it and how to persuade uh, an audience that they that they would like to buy this product. So at this point, I just want to show you a few more specific examples. Some of these may not be unfamiliar to you, um, but let's just take a look. So here's an example of using, a, um, using an online platform to work at the, at the vocabulary level, at the word level. Uh, here's a list of some phrasal verbs that all involve the word take. Um, and as we know, phrasal verbs are very challenging for English learners. Get to my... Quizlet. So I was able to uh, make some Quizlet flashcards out of these. And so, of course, you can see that on one side you have the definition, on the other side you have the words. So you can practice, you can quiz yourself. Uh, but with, with a platform like Quizlet, another feature that is really fun and definitely adds to the competitive element is to play the games that are on that are there on Quizlet. So if you if you choose match and start the game, we have the make everything disappear game. And so you drag and drop and take your, I'm not gonna do all of it, but what's fun about this, what I've found to be fun about this is once I do it and my time is posted, if my students are um, have access to the same Quizlet, I can say, okay, students, this was my time. I did it in 15 seconds, who can beat me? Um, and they can, in class or on their own later, they can try to do it and see who can beat the teacher's time or who can get the best time. And those times get posted in the, in the Quizlet.
So just another idea of ways to use those flashcard apps and games. Um, another quiz game, I had mentioned quiz games earlier, um, and this is just an example of a site that would allow you to create a Jeopardy game, which uh, is quite fun and competitive for groups of students. So this is an example of a, a Jeopardy game that I created for my um, academic reading students who were all also enrolled in a world history class. And so you can choose them. I didn't set it up as true Jeopardy. It's questions, not answers. But um, you, know, you can choose and have the students give their answers and then um, it shows the correct answer on there. Um, I also think it's important to, to give us a chance to, to be a little creative and innovative when we talk about games. Maybe you have a lot of games that work at the word level or the vocabulary level, but you think, how can I take this up a level? How can I extend this to build my students' skills in other ways, not just they know a word and now they know the definition? Um, so I think it's really good to think about how we can extend the level. One way to do this is with the memory matching game that I mentioned before. Um, with just straight memory matching, you have words and definitions, you try to match them on the cards. Um, that's very much a word level. But I can extend this to the sentence level or the syntax level by doing what I call memory matching plus. So when I play this with my students in academic reading, if they're, they're in their group, if they've gotten a match with the word card and the definition card, they don't get the point until they create a meaningful sentence using that word. And so they should make a sentence that shows that they understand something about the meaning of that word. Tell the sentence to their group members. And if the group members approve, then they get the point. So very simple as a way to take that from a, a vocabulary level activity to a syntax level activity. Um, other ways to extend the level of a vocabulary type game, um, as I mentioned before, word association. If we just go around the room and have everyone say a word that comes to their mind from the previous word, that's great. But if we wanna take it up a level, we can also incorporate explaining the relationship. Why did you say the word that you said? So for example, maybe we start a word association game and the first word is moose and it's my turn. I see moose and I think basketball. That might sound strange to you, but I can explain it. Here at LCC, we have sports teams, we have basketball and football, and our mascot or our symbol for the teams is the moose. So when I think about moose, I often think about basketball. Now the word is basketball. Martina, do you have an association? How about Michael Jordan? Okay, she said Michael Jordan. Can you explain your association? Because he's the greatest basketball player and the only one I know. <laughs> okay, and now the word is Michael Jordan and maybe I say sneakers. And I might say that because of course, his name is on some very popular uh, Nike sneakers, Air Jordans. Maybe the next person says socks because when they put on their sneakers, first they put on their socks. And maybe the next person then says laundry because when they think about socks, they think about all the dirty socks that they need to wash at home. So hopefully you can see that we've gone from just saying words to now having to um, talk and think about 
the relationships between them. And that's something that's happening at the semantic level. Another way to um, potentially extend a vocabulary level activity to the semantic level is, again, this very simple activity that can be done with, with a class of students is called Connect2. And so this is an example of Connect2. I've got some of the vocabulary words from a recent academic reading lesson here on the screen. I might ha have them on my board in the classroom. And I will ask the students to find a connection that they can find between two of these words and be ready to explain why they connected them. So for example, um, maybe someone will say, oh, I want to connect factor and aspect. Why is that? Well, both of them give us the idea about part of a larger whole. Okay, great. I'll draw, I'll draw a line between those two because that's a good connection. Um, or maybe someone says, oh, I want to connect consequence with impact. Oh, why do you want to do that? Well, because these both have to do with the results that can come from an action. Great connection. So I would draw a line between those two. So at any level of vocabulary, this is possible to do. And of course, different people will notice or think about different connections. So as long as they can explain it, as long as they can justify it, it works. Okay. So as I mentioned, I think we should try to play a game together um, here online. And so let's play a game that's really a variation on the game categories, and it's called Stop the Bus. So let me uh, explain the rules of this simple game, and then we'll have a chance to try it. So on the next slide, which I'll show you in a moment, you're going to see a simple table with uh, several columns with different categories. So your first step will be to copy that table down just onto a piece of paper that you have at home. Um, we will generate a random letter online. So we'll choose a letter of the alphabet. And then when I say go, your job is to write one item in each category that begins with the chosen letter. Okay. And, and I'll show you an example in a second. When you have a word for each category, then you can type in the chat, stop the bus. Okay. If we were playing this together in a classroom, you could shout it out, stop the bus but we'll type in the chat and then we'll check the answers. So if you're the first person to type stop the bus, we'll ask you to type your type each of your words into the chat and we can check the first person to complete each category with no mistakes is the winner. Okay, so here's the table with an example. Uh, so you can see what I'm talking about. So you can see we have six categories here, animal, color, country, food, clothes and sports. Um, and the example from an earlier uh, choosing of letters uh, was R, R was the chosen letter. And so there's a word that starts with R for each category that we see there. Okay, so I'll give you a moment to write down the categories so that you have your own table at home. Animal, color, country, food, clothes, and sports. Okay, and then I will get the random letter generator going here. Spin the wheel and hopefully we'll get a good letter. If we don't get a good letter, we'll spin again. Mm, y is not a great letter for this. I'm going to I'm going to spin again. X is even worse. Okay, I'm going to choose a letter. The letter is S. Letter S is our designated letter. Thank you random letter generator. <laughs> so, the letter is S. And are you ready to fill in your categories? Go.
Ah, oh, stop the bus, says Andrus. Okay, great. All right, we'll pause. Andrus, can you type your six words into the chat and we will check them. So if you are, if you were still writing when he said stop the bus, yes, I will show it again. Um, if you were still writing when he said stop the bus, you can still fill in categories because maybe he has a mistake. I will also said it right after. Okay. Are we able to check? Ah, snake, silver, Switzerland, sandwich, sneakers, and squash. Very good. All right. And they are, they all fit the categories and I don't see any spelling mistakes. Well, sneakers, close enough. Um, <laughs> so, ah, Ludmilla also shared her seal, good, silver, Sweden, sandwich, shorts, and swimming. Very good. Great job. So that's something, again, we can do in the classroom as a way to, to review vocabulary, to practice, just pulling out words that students know quickly. Uh, here's a list of just a few helpful websites um, I've used most of these, um, and I know other teachers here at LCC have used many of these as well uh, to, to find games or to create games. All of these have tools and templates and maybe even pre-made games in some cases available. So just wanted to share these with you as, um, as a helpful resource. And to, to wrap up this uh, presentation, there are a couple of questions and maybe you'll have a chance to think, of, think about at least one of these. I'm just curious, which game would you like to try? Or another way that you might wanna think about it is, which of these games do you think you could adapt to use in your context? Because we are all in very different teaching situations, I know. Um, and so maybe something that I shared here, you think, oh, it's, an, it's a new idea for me. Maybe I could make it work in my situation. So I'd like you to, if you have an idea, if you have an answer to one of these questions, just to type in the chat and we'll see what seems useful. Okay, snowball, stop the bus, yeah. Yeah, oh good, yeah, play it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, and again, everybody likes snowballs. Snowballs is so easy, so it's great. It doesn't take time to prepare. Um, connect to, yeah, connect to is also, it, it's, it's not time consuming to prepare. Um, everybody wants to play stop the bus now. <laughs> Can I show the previous slide? Yes, I'll go back to the, um, the list of sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, memory matching. Memory matching can be a little bit time consuming to prepare, but once you have it, it's easy to pull out. Um, running dictation, again, not very time consuming. And once the students know what to do, um, it's very engaging. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Great, yes. Yeah, word association, so easy. Um, the slide of the phonology games, sure, I'll go back to that in a second. Um, can I, I can, can I make this available via email, Martina? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to share the slides um, and assuming that we have all of the email addresses, we can, we can make that available. Um, okay, so whoops. Me. What did I do? So 
sorry, just a second. I want to go back to the um, examples of phonology games that someone uh, requested that. Is that visible to you? I hope so. Oops. Yeah. Okay. Um, someone's asking for a re-explanation of snowballs. Should I, is that good to just explain again? Okay. Um, yes, well, we'll make, we'll make the slides available. Um, I don't know about the recording. That's Martina's nodding her head. Um, so it should be possible to watch a recording of the session. Um, yes, yes, we will share the presentation via email. Um, quick explanation of snowballs. Again, this is a this is a vocabulary word and definition matching game. So if you have the students in pairs and oh, you should like stop the bus at our mother tongue. Fun. Uh, the students are in pairs. Each pair has a word that they are responsible for. And each student has a piece of paper, just blank paper. Um, so in the pair, one student makes sure that the word gets written on their paper and the other student makes sure that the definition of that word gets written on their paper. When everyone has a word and a definition in their pair on separate pieces of paper, then they're allowed to crumble the paper up into a ball, into a snowball. And the teacher makes a time limit. And I, I say maybe 15 seconds and has the students all stand up. And for the next 15 seconds, we're just going to throw the snowballs at each other. You throw as many snowballs as you can. So they throw, one comes near them, they pick it up, they throw again, snowballs are flying around the room. And when the time is up, each person picks up a ball from, from the floor and opens it up. They have either a word or a definition on there and then they need to find their match, find the word that goes with their definition or vice versa. So it's very easy. It's, it takes no time, very little time to set up and plan um, and the students really enjoy it. <laughs> yes, Alma, thank you for playing. <laughs> sort of making us play and have fun. Great. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming, for participating, for sharing your good ideas. Um, I'm really happy to, to see how much game playing is going on in English language classrooms all around the region and beyond um, and to hear some of your good ideas as well. So thank you everyone. And yes, we will, we will make the slides and the recording available to you. <laughs> Great, thank you everyone. You can stop sharing the screen. Thank you, Gretchen. This was really an interesting um, webinar. I played the stop the bus game together with you. Um, so thank you again for um, spending this evening with us. And based on what we see in the comments section and the chat section, if you come away from the seminar with at least some good practical ideas, we're so happy um, to be able to share this with you. Um, if we haven't answered some of the questions to you, I do want to uh, invite you to reach out to us. And here are our contact details. Uh, you can email us directly at the English Language Center. And you can also follow us on Facebook using this handle here. We're happy to talk more about English language uh, teaching practices and share what we 
um, know. And we're also really looking forward um, to seeing you in the next webinar, which is same time next week on Wednesday, and you will receive the link to the webinar um, shortly before uh, the time comes. Thank you once again, and we wish you a great evening and see you again soon. Thank you so much for joining us. Um,